spare your last name. My name is Megan Fletcher, F-L-E-T-C-H-E-R. Good afternoon, Ms. Fletcher. Good afternoon. With the court's permission, we're going to end day 12, okay? Yes, sir. Um, would you please tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury about yourself, but also your background, your training, and your training in the field of expertise I've asked you to testify about here today, please? Yes, sir. Uh, so I grew up in Ohio. I was born and raised there. After I graduated from high school, I attended Chatham College in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I graduated from there in 2005 with my bachelor's degree in biochemistry and English. After that, I went to Marshall University, where I obtained my master's in forensic science, emphasizing in computer forensics and forensic chemistry in 2007. I then started my career at SLED in 2007 as well, where I started my training to become a trace evidence analyst in the forensic services laboratory. And the first thing that I be, uh, started training in was gunshot primer residue analysis. Why did you come to South Carolina? Uh, for the job. Okay. Did you have any relatives here or family? I do, but it was really for the job. Trace evidence was always kind of my dream job. Okay. Um, so tell us some more about trace evidence and your training and your background and what you loved about it. So trace evidence is a type of evidence that you can't typically see with the naked eye. So you need a microscope or other types of instrumentation to be able to detect it. Uh, for trace evidence in the forensic services laboratory at SLED, we consider explosives, fire debris, fibers, glass, uh, gunshot primer residue, paint, fibers, uh, physical fit analysis, pressure sensitive tape, and general physical and chemical unknowns, all different types of trace evidence. Specifically in the field of gunshot primer residents, tell us about your training, um, your experience, um, and what has led you to this point where I'm going off you for an expert in just a minute. So in 2007, I started my career. I started my training at that point. I began an 11-month training program for uh, gunshot primer residue analysis. It's an in-house training program that consists of practical written and oral examinations in the theory of gunshot primer residue, as well as the instrumentation used to analyze that type of evidence. So, so what is it? Gunshot primer residue, uh, well, let's start with gunshot residue. Gunshot residue is everything that comes out of a gun when it's fired. That's the smoke, the soot, the flame, burned and unburned uh, gunpowder particles, but also something called gunshot primer residue. And that's what we're looking for at the trace lab at SLED. Gunshot primer residue particles are microscopic molten particles that contain the elements lead, barium, and antimony. They come from the primer uh, component of the cartridge. And can you explain some more? How do you, how do you examine it? What do you do to determine if there's gunshot primer residue? Uh, so I believe that you've already heard about how gunshot primer residue is collected. It's collected using those uh, particle lifts with the sticky surfaces. Once I get those particle lifts in the lab, I will then examine them on a scanning electron microscope with an energy expressive, or ex, I'm sorry, dispersive X-ray detector. Uh, so an SEM EDX. Now what's the second thing you said, the SEM, and what did you say after that? Energy dispersive X-ray detector. What is that? Well, the scanning electron microscopes, a super powerful microscope. Uh, you might be used to a light microscope uh, that you might have used in school, and that might uh, magnify something around 400 times. The scanning electron microscope uses, uses electrons instead. And so we can magnify things 30,000, 50,000 times. The energy dispersive X-ray detector allows us to analyze the sample for which elements are actually present in the sample. So the SEM component, the microscope component, allows us to see a sample and analyze the shape and the morphology of a given sample. But the EDX component allows us to see uh, what elements are actually present in that individual sample. Now, when I first started years ago, we were just looking for the three elements. 
How has that changed over the years in your specific field? So currently, we are looking for characteristic particles of gunshot primer residue. It's a singular particle that contains all three elements of lead, barium, and antimony. It can't be a particle that contains one or two of those elements. It has to contain all three of those. And that didn't used to be the case, did it? Uh, no, sir, it did not. So it's got to contain all three of them? Yes, sir. Before you'll clarify it as what? Before or determine I, as what? I'm sorry? Before you'll determine as what? It's got to clarify. It's got to contain all three of them. Go ahead. It has, to, it has to be microscopic, it has to be molten, and it has to contain lead barium and antimony in order for me to report it as characteristic of gunshot primer residue. And I know everybody knows it except me, but what's molten? So molten uh, appears to be rounded in shape. It, it looks like it underwent high heat and pressure. Uh, lots of times they're spherical, so like a ball, but sometimes they might look like a football just have to have like a rounded shape to the edges. And, and how does evidence get to you, forensic scientist Megan Fletcher? How does it actually come to you? Uh, there's different circumstances, but typically evidence is submitted um, from a local agency, local agency or SLED, and it's submitted through the evidence control department. The evidence control department assigns it a unique lab number, and each item of evidence uh, is assigned an item at that time. It then is brought up to the trace lab by either myself or another analyst or a technician, and then it goes through the process of inventory and then analysis. How long have you been doing this? Uh, over 15 years. You love your job? I do. And um, how many um, analysis have you performed? Uh, in the field of, well, in trace evidence to start with. Uh, over 1,500 cases, uh, samples, well over 3,000. And have you been offered in courts of record of this state and other states perhaps as an expert in the field of trace evidence and gunshot primer residue? And have you been so accepted in courts of record of this state as an expert in trace evidence and gunshot primer residue? Yes, sir, 49 times. Your Honor, this time the state of South Carolina would offer forensic scientist Megan M. Fletcher is an expert in the field of trace evidence to include gunshot primer residue. We have no objection to her making it 50 times, Your Honor. <laughs> and we thank you. She is so qualified in the field of trace evidence and gunshot primer residue. Why, why do you love your job? I just find it really interesting. With trace evidence, I get to analyze different types of evidence. Um, my daily job duties can change depending on what needs to be done that day. Let's go over some, just, but on a live, well, a live person, human being, yes, blood, sir. blood flowing. Yes, sir. Um, is there a period of time after which SLED's guidelines say we won't, um, to determine if there's gunshot primer residue Yes, sir. What, what, what is it? Beyond six hours, we will not analyze a GSR kit from a living individual. And the reason that we will not analyze that is because in-house studies as well as peer-reviewed published studies have shown that gunshot residue so readily transfers and so red is so readily removed uh, around four to six hours that beyond six hours it couldn't be tied back to initial uh, to an initial incident and what's the common sense answer why that you won't do it after six hours uh, so if you shoot a gun as soon as you put that gun down you essentially start to remove those gunshot primer residue particles they aren't destroyed but you're simply transferring them to other objects you might be putting your hands in your pocket you might touch a steering wheel you might wash your hands, and that would remove most, if not all, of the particles. So beyond that four hours, you're really looking at the total removal of those particles. So if you didn't wash your hands, just, just, just everyday living or touching could, after over four hours, you wouldn't want to, or six hours, I think you said it is now. Six hours is our policy, but an in-house study with, um, with controlled participants where we informed them that they weren't allowed to wash their hands and 
told them to basically stick to clerical work, we really saw that drop off around four hours. Okay. Uh, if you did wash your hands, um, and you know somebody washed their hands, they told you, hey, I washed my hands, would you test it? We would. Okay. But would you expect most of them to be gone at that point from I'd, washing your hands? It depends on how well you wash your hands. Okay. Um, we expect most of it to be gone, but we've seen it to still be present even after somebody's washed their hands. And, and, and you did a little bit, if you can do a little bit more for me. Um, gunshot primer residue, is there a certain, I mean, how do you determine, is, it, is there a certain distance, vicinity, shooting? I mean, what, what are you looking for in determining whether gunshot residue is present, whether someone was in the vicinity to get it? So really what we're trying to determine when we're looking for gunshot primer residue is one, were they in the vicinity to the discharge of a firearm? Were they shooting a firearm? Or is it simply transfer? And in most cases, we can't determine whether it's vicinity, which includes shooting, or uh, simply transfer. Discharge, vicinity, which just means are you close to it? Uh, yeah, so vicinity can be two to three feet to either side of the shooter and outwards of about 60 feet in front of the shooter. Discharge, vicinity, and transfer. What do you mean by transfer? So you can get, uh, you can get gunshot residue on your hands from an object that already has gunshot residue on it or from a person who has gunshot residue on them. So if somebody else shoots a gun and you shake their hands, you could get gunshot residue on your hand that way. You could also touch a recently fired or a dirty weapon and get gunshot residue on your hands that way. So if I was, if you had just fired a firearm and I came up to shake your hand, could I get it from that? That is possible. Okay. If I reached under to grab you to turn you, could I get it if you had been shot with gunshot residue? Uh, so gunshot residue does travel with the path of the bullet. So we do expect to find it on victims who have sustained gunshot wounds. And around that gunshot wound specifically, we do expect to find uh, gunshot primer residue particles. So if you touch that area, there is the possibility of transfer. Okay. And again, if you don't mind me touching you on the arm, if you had gunshot residue on your arm and I did that, could I get it? That is a possibility as well. And what's that called? Uh, so in that case, uh, that would be a secondary or tertiary transfer. Transfer? Yes. From one item you're to me? Yes, sir. And the other way is if I fire the firearm. Yes, sir. And if I fire the firearm, where would you, or where do you look for to see if somebody's fired a firearm with, based on what they're wearing? Like if I was wearing this right now, fired something here, and you had this jacket, where would you look for potential gunshot residue? So if I knew that that was what the, you were wearing uh, at the time of the shooting, we would sample from the right sleeve of that jacket the right chest area of the jacket, the left sleeve of the jacket, and the left chest area of the jacket. We may also want to sample the tie because it's center on um, your chest, and then the right side of your pants and the left side of your pants. And then your shoes are also a possibility. Why is that? Uh, because your shoes are also in the vicinity to the discharge of a firearm. Sometimes we get results off of them, sometimes we don't. Okay. And would you test my hands? Uh, that would be the best evidence is the hands because the hands will allow us to link it to a specific incident within six hours, whereas clothing, we can't tell you when it got there. And that's because on an inanimate object such as clothing, that gunshot primer residue is going to stay until it's actively removed. So you would have to brush it off, you would have to wash it off, you would have to do some activity to actually remove it from the clothing. And that was the next thing I was getting into. You beat, beat me to it. So but if I just shot and washed my hands off, potentially I could have washed it all, gunshot primer, res uh, gunshot primer residue off, correct? Correct. Okay. But on inanimate objects, and you just said it, and I apologize, how long can gunshot residue stay on? Uh, indefinitely, if it just, if you don't touch it, if you're not actively um, moving it around or washing it, it can stay until it's removed. Okay. Well, now let's just say I'm dead, okay? Okay. And I got shot just a few feet. You shot me from my feet. Okay. Okay. I thought about it. Would you expect to have gunshot residue on me? Uh, it depends on the firearm, but in general, yes. And why is that? Uh, so the gunshot primer residue 
comes out, a large majority of the gunshot primer residue comes out the muzzle of the firearm. And not only does it come out the muzzle of the firearm, but it also follows the path of the bullet. And so wherever that bullet's going, it, it's going to follow behind it. And, and the follow-up to that is, do, is it SLED's recommendation now? If you know, like me, I've been shot, do y'all test for gunshot or will you test for gunshot residue on a deceased person who you know has been killed with a firearm? A SLED will not test uh, on victims who have sustained gunshot wounds. Uh, and we have not been testing on those victims since January of 2022. And prior to that, was it your policy not to do that or recommend to local law enforcement agencies not to do that? We didn't have an official policy, but we were recommending it due to the lack of probative information that you could gain from it. And just, just say that one more time. What do you mean by the lack of probative information? So, like I said before, gunshot residue can only put somebody in the vicinity to the discharge of a firearm, or it could say that they transfer gunshot residue on them. So it's just putting gunshot crime residue on them. A victim's already of a gunshot wound has already been established to be in the vicinity to the discharge of a firearm. So it doesn't add any additional information to the case. Okay. Now there's still other items like stippling, which you're not, do you know about stippling based in your field of expertise? That's not in my field okay. of expertise. Now let's, let's get to this case. Uh, forensic scientist, Megan Fletcher. Did you have an occasion to examine some items for a potential uh, gunshot primer residue? Yes, sir, I did. I think we have these marked so I can find them. Shirt in the pants. We'll try to take these in the dates, the order that you, chronological order of when you examine. Okay. You follow me? I do. And I'm going to show you what Mark states 418. And uh, if you, do you want, you like gloves? I have some with me. Okay, and I think we also have some here. I thought we had a home box here. I think that they're on the floor. You got some? Okay. And, and, and why are you using gloves? I use gloves um, to protect myself and to protect the evidence. Uh, it's, I don't want to put any of my DNA or any of anything that might be on myself onto the evidence, and I don't want anything that might be on the evidence on me. And, and, and not just gloves. In your laboratory, and I thought I asked you to bring one, but do you wear a um, lab coat? Uh, when we process uh, clothing, we do uh, wear uh, lab, lab coats, and that helps protect us from um, our regular clothes from uh, transferring over any evidence onto, or not evidence, but any materials over onto the evidence. And that's, protect, that's to protect the evidence, really, as much as you, isn't it? Yes, sir. Okay, so you have a lab coat and gloves before you start looking at these items. Uh, well, this also has a DNA um, request on it. Usually the requests are also on the outside of the box. So the answer is you have your white coat and gloves on when you're in the lab looking at these? Yes, okay. but because it has a DNA request, we also have a mask on. Okay, well, thank you for that. Okay, you have a mask in addition to that? Yes. Okay, please open 418 and tell the jury what it is. Bless you. This is SLED Lab L21-09074, item 19. Um, I recognize it with our yellow barcode sticker. And this is SLED Lab number L21-09074, uh, item number 20, again, with our yellow barcode sticker. And what date did you examine these on? I didn't physically examine these items. Uh, Jamie Hall would have taken the particle lifts off of these items, so her initials and date would be on everything. But that, um, the date that she did that would have been June 8th. Okay. 
And when did you actually look at them? I looked at the, she did call me in while she was processing them, but I didn't physically take chain, or custody of these items. And I understand that. Maybe I was jumping ahead in my mind. Did you have an occasion when Jamie Hall was processing? You say she called you in there? She did. Okay, why? Uh, she smelled um, something rather unusual for our evidence. Our evidence is usually um, pretty musky smelling. And when she opened up item 19, which is the white t-shirt, she did um, smell a strong odor of laundry detergent, and I did confirm that with her. So she smelled that, said, hey, come in here. I want you to see this or whatever. Did you have, could you smell it? I could smell the laundry detergent as well. Oh, it smelled like laundry detergent? Yes, sir. Did you also, so she, she, she took a sample from there, a lift, if you will. Um, so you were examining the lifts off the shirt, correct? Correct. And the pants? Correct. Did you also get to look at the pants that uh, day on June 8th when uh, Ms. Hall looked at them? I don't remember if I was in there when she processed the shorts, but I have seen pictures of that she took of the shorts. Okay. And can you describe the shirt and the shorts when you saw them, the pictures of them? Uh, the shirt is a white t-shirt. There is some staining on the lower left hand side, but relatively clean. The green cargo shorts are clean. Now, what did you do um, and while, while, while we're here? Did you also uh, receive the... Uh, Forensic scientist, let's let's start with the shirt. Okay. Tell the jury specifically now. We got all that. Tell them specifically. What did you do when you examined the particle lifts in that shirt? Uh, the particle lifts uh, were analyzed on the scanning electron microscope, and how we do that in our lab, and how most laboratories throughout the world actually do it, is use a software program to help us out, and that's because the particles that we're looking at are so small. If, uh, if you can imagine two football fields, we're actually looking for particles the size of a pea on those, two part on those two football fields. So we use a software that does a little bit of an automated analysis, and that automated analysis uses brightness and contrast that's associated with known particles of gunshot primer residue. And it does that automated analysis overnight for us and in the, the next day or over the weekend, whatever it is, we come in and then it provides us a list of candidate features. It tells us what features that it thinks contain the elements lead, barium, and antimony. As the analyst, I then look at those features, I relocate to, to them on the SEM. So I physically drive the SEM back to, that, um, to the location that it saved I look at the particle, make sure that it's molten in nature, and then I use the energy dispersive X-ray detector to scan the particle to determine whether lead barium and antimony are present. And, and I think Ms. Hall described where she took the particle list from. Can, can, did you determine were there any uh, gunshot residue? What did you find on the shirt? Particles characteristic of gunshot primer residue were found. Particles characteristic of gunshot primer residue are microscopic molten particles that contain the elements lead, barium, and antimony. And it can come from? Uh, it can come from being in the vicinity to the discharge of a firearm or being transferred from an object that has gunshot primer residue on it. No time frame can be provided as to when these particles were uh, deposited. And as far as 418 in evidence, the shirt, can you tell where the particle lifts were from? like from the right sleeve, the right chest side. Can I refer to my notes, please? Please. I think it's Ronald, his honor will let you. So for the white t-shirt from the particle lift that was collected from the right sleeve, right chest area, two particles characteristic of gunshot primer residue were found 
and from the left sleeve, left chest area, the particle lift collected from there, one particle characteristic of gunshot primer residue were, was found. Those, uh, those particle lifts are combined into one result for a result of multiple particles. What does that mean that you found two, two particle lifts? I mean, as far as the amount of particles you found, what does that mean in your field of expertise? My opinion is that that object, this T-shirt, was either in the vicinity to the discharge of a firearm or came into contact with something that had gunshot primer residue on it. I can't tell you the likelihood which one is more likely to have happened. And, and that's, 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 that's your opinion, correct? That's my opinion. Right. Now, also in 418, and again, these were the defendant's shirts, pants, and clothes that, I mean, and shoes that we're going to get to in a minute that you were examining, correct? That's, that's my understanding, yes. Okay. That's what the chain showed? Uh, that's what the submission showed, yes. Yeah. Submission slip, thank you. Now let's go to the uh, pants. Did you have an occasion to examine a particle list that Ms. Hall did? Yes, sir, I did. Okay, and uh, again, uh, and, and we may not go through this every time, but can you tell the jury what you did again when you were examining the particle list, please? So the particle lifts from the shorts were analyzed the same way as the particle lifts from the shirt, the same way that we analyze every particle lift that's submitted for gunshot primer residue or collected for gunshot primer residue. It goes through the automated process. I go in, I confirm or, that there are particles present or that there aren't particles present. Uh, can, can you tell me, did you locate any particles and where they were on yeah. the shorts, please? Yes, sir. On the right side, right groin area, there were two particles located and confirmed. And then on the left groin area, there was one particle located and confirmed. And you issued a report. What's your, what are your findings as a result of finding these particle lists on the shorts uh, that the submission slip said belonged to the defendant on states 418? What, what's your opinion? Uh, particles characteristic of gunshot primer residue were found. Uh, again, my opinion is that, that they were these sh this pair of shorts would, were either in the vicinity to the discharge of a firearm or came in contact with something that had gunshot primer residue on it. Again, I can't tell you which is more likely, and I can't tell you when those particles were deposited. So they could have come from a transfer of holding a gun and then putting it on your pants? That's correct. Could have come from being in the vicinity of a shot? That's correct. <clears throat> Could they have come from discharging? Well, the shorts themselves can't discharge. So in, on an inanimate object, we just say that they're in the vicinity to the discharge. That's what I meant, yeah, in the vicinity. The vicinity of a discharge. Yes, sir. Obviously, they can't discharge, <laughs> um, respectfully. Now, um, did you have an occasion to examine the lifts from Al Smirnoff's hands that were lifted by Barnadell, I believe? Yes, sir, I did. And they're already in evidence. Um, and you basically, after Jamie Hall says, hey, these are all done right, they then go to you, right? Uh, yes, sir. These That's are already not, in evidence. Um, That's not the GSF. These aren't the GSF. Yeah. Anyway, I don't think we need this in evidence. Did you have an occasion to uh, examine the GSR kit? I did. Was taken from Alex Murnau? Yes, sir, I did. And did you know, you've talked about that four hour, six hour period. Again, was that checked? And did you make sure that that was collected in the time period or you wouldn't have performed your examination? That's correct. Not only is it uh, checked by the person inventorying, in this case, Jamie Hall, uh, before I will sign off on that inventory sheet, I also double check the GSR information form. That GSR information form that is included in the kit is also scanned, so we retain a record of it so that I can go back and double check that it was within the six hours. Okay, so you did that? I did. All right, and as, what was your, uh, did your examination conclude as far as um, the, the uh, particle lift that was taken from the defendant, Alex Murdoch? So one particle lift was collected from his right hand and one from his left hand. One particle characteristic of gunshot primer residue was found. In general, particles characteristic of gunshot primer residue are microscopic, molten particles that contain the elements lead, barium, and antimony. Gunshot primer residue can come from the discharging of a firearm, being in the vicinity to the discharge of a firearm, or coming into contact with a surface that has gunshot primer residue on it. 
And y'all are going to say that uh, conclusion if it's got just a few particle lifts or a bunch of them. I'm sorry. Just what a general conclusion. That's what you're going to find that there are particle lifts and it can come from one of those three ways, right? Yes, sir. Discharge, vicinity. For hands, we have one of those three ways. For clothing, we only have the vicinity and the transfer. Right. So is that consistent? If, if I grabbed one of these firearms and handed it to an officer, would that be consistent with the, your findings? You can get it from a transfer of a firearm? You could get one particle from transferring um, from a firearm, yes. If you fired a firearm and washed your hands and then grabbed a firearm and handed it to a police officer, would that be consistent with that also? Well, you still had that transfer from the firearm. Um, it didn't really matter what you did prior to that. Um, you still could have had that one particle on your hands from that transfer of of the firearm. Did you have an occasion to examine the shoes? I did. Article list from the shoes. Yes, sir. States 419. You still got your gloves on? No, but I can put another pair on. And what were you provided regarding these shoes? Uh, we were provided that these were the shoes collected from um, Richard Alexander Murdoch. And did you, uh, were you able, were you able, well tell me what your examination from the particle list revealed. Uh, no particles characteristic of gunshot primer residue uh, were detected. How many? None. None? No. None. You know, think about the lab. Did you really know about, do you know anything about the case that you're, I mean, at that point, you're examining something, you don't know anything about who's wearing what or what you're examining, do you? Or who's you're examining, other than the submission slips. No, I know who it, who it is based on the submission sheet, right. which is important because it has to come from somebody who didn't cons um, sustain a gunshot wound. Okay, and I got that. That was a bad but, question. But other than that, you don't know about the case or what evidence, potential evidence, right? I just know that it's a, it was a priority request. Okay. You don't know what shoes that the potential suspect was wearing the day, during the day or how many shoes they were wearing, if they were even wearing shoes, do you? No, sir. So your results after finding no gunshot primer residue or what on your report? Will you read it like you uh, reported it? Yes, sir. No particles characteristic of gunshot primer residue detected. The absence of primer residue on the item is consistent with, but not limited to the following scenarios. The item not being in the vicinity to the discharge of a firearm, cleaning of the item, excessive blood or debris on the item, environmental factors including wind and rain, the ammunition discharged, lead-free, non-toxic, or some 22 caliber rimfire ammunition not producing particles characteristic of the conventional primer residue, or the, primer, or the firearm not producing primer residue on the item when discharged. So at this point, you've examined a shirt? Yes, sir. Shorts? Yes. Hands. Hands. Yes, sir. Punch up. And shoes. Yes. And the date you examined all those again was what? Uh, the date that they were placed on the. The particle list that you examined, yes. Yes. The date they were placed on the scanning electron microscope was June 8th, 2021. Okay. June 8th. Uh, yes, sir. Okay. And that's the same day that Jamie Hall smelled them. Smelled the shirt. Yes, sir. The same day you smelled the shirt. Yes, sir.
Did you receive any of the items in this investigation where you were requested to determine whether or not there was any gunshot primer residue? Yes, sir. Okay. And I want to show you now what's, I believe, uh, with everybody's help, states number 100, the seatbelt. You said a priority was placed on this case, right? Yes, sir. I apologize. It, Do you sometimes, or are, have you been present when Jamie Hall was doing the particle lifts and have you actually assisted? Uh, yes, sir, especially if there is an abnormal item submitted for um, analysis. All right, and abnormal's got a lot of definitions, but in your world, what does that abnormal mean? So typical items that we receive are obviously gunshot residue kits, but clothing items like t-shirts or hooded sweatshirts or pants or shorts or shoes, so things that we can have a st standard operating procedure for uh, those things we can say that we're going to collect from the same areas every single time. Um, other items are not so typical and then require a little bit more um, analysis on them. States 100, is that example of one of those? Yes, a seat belt would be an abnormal item. Do you know when you examine this? Uh, the seatbelt was examined on September 1st, 2021. Okay. And it's brought to your lab? Correct. To the director's lab, excuse me. And uh, is this what you examined? Uh, yes, sir. And did you actually assist Ms. Hall in attempting to get particle lifts off this? Yes, sir, I did. Okay, so you were both in the room? Correct. Gloves on? Yes. Jacket on? Yes. Mask on? Yes. Okay. And can you tell these folks, uh, can you help me tell them what, what this is and where you attempted to get particle lifts. Yes. So this is, I had to Google this because I'm not super familiar with a seatbelt assembly. Uh, this is considered the buckle. Uh, this is the part that everybody sees in their vehicle. This bottom portion is what is in between the center console and the seat and not exposed um, when a person is sitting sitting in the vehicle. So if I'm, if I'm driving, is this going to be on my right side? It should be on your right side, yes. Okay. And what is this? So, if we start. Here, the next part that everybody's familiar with is the latch plate, which goes into the buckle. And then there's an entire belt that goes into the retractor wheel. Can you and pull it? Let's pull it. <coughs> Don't let it go. All I right. got it. Where did y'all attempt, you, you and Ms. Hall attempt to get particle lifts? We, um, so we stretched it out as far as it would go and we took samples, three samples from the belt, uh, front or both sides, and we, um, we just divided it into three sections and took samples from those three sections. And this was an abnormal item that you assisted Ms. Hall with? Yes, sir. Okay. Will you please tell, tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury the results of your examination, if any? Yes, sir. One particle characteristic of gunshot primer residue is found. In general, particles characteristic of gunshot primer residue are microscopic molten particles that contain the elements lead, barium, and antimony. Gunshot primer residue can come from being in the vicinity to the discharge of a firearm or coming into contact with a surface that has gunshot primer residue on it. However, no information can be provided as to the time frame in which this particle was deposited. So in common sense term, how could that get on the seat belt? Where did you actually find the particle? The particle was um, located on the particle lift uh, collected from the buckle. So that piece with the red button. Okay. Just in common sense, in your expert opinion, how could a, uh, that particle get on that buckle? Uh, it, it could be from touching something that has gunshot primer residue on it, uh, or possibly being in the vicinity to the discharge of a firearm. So it could be a transfer? It, it's probably most likely a transfer, yes, sir. Okay. So why is it probably most likely a transfer? Uh, it's just usually not exposed to the vicinity. If there isn't a gunshot out of that vehicle, then transfer is the most likely scenario. This makes sense, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, 
<clears throat> well, you submitted another uh, potential piece of evidence in this case, forensic yes. scientist Megan Fletcher. Yes, sir, I was. And uh, what was that? Uh, this was a, um, a blue rain jacket, uh, kind of poncho type jacket. Do you know when you, I guess when that came into your custody, when you, when you uh, looked at it the first time? October 5th, 2021. Excuse me, Your Honor. We, we renew our earlier objection to this evidence under 403, but we don't have any additional objections. Yes, sir. Submitted. I first want to show you, I don't know if I'm going to use that ammo or not yet, but just showing what's um, 430 right now. Is that what you examined? Uh, those are images of what I examined, yes. Images of what to examine. Yes, sir. And, and, and tell the folks where you conducted this examination specifically. Uh, I conducted this examination in the Trace Evidence Laboratory. I may need them. In the Trace Laboratory. Yes, sir. And I, and I first noticed there's a there's a um, well states 430. It, it appears that the, um, well, let me put this on here. I'm sorry. It looks like it's, it's on a table or something. It's actually on two tables. It was, it was large enough in order for us to be able to lay it out. We had to put two tables together. Large enough you had to put two tables together? Yes, sir. Okay. And, and why is it on this white? Uh, what's it on? What's, it, what's underneath? Uh, underneath it is butcher paper, and that's um, used to protect the item of evidence, but also used to collect any um, trace evidence that may need to be examined. And, and it looks like on the right there may be a, a ruler or a measurement. Uh, yes, that's a, it was just a sticker with ruler on it just to help guide us with the size, general size of it. We didn't take any specific measurements of anything. But is it fair to say that that's how it looked when you saw it in October? Yes, sir, it is. Okay, October 8th? October 5th. 5th, excuse me, of 21. This report was dated October 8th. I apologize. You're with Miss Hall, you had your jacket on, your gloves on, your mask on? Yes, sir. And, and tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury, did it take two of you to do this? Uh, yes, sir, it did. Uh, why? Uh, so I uh, gave uh, Jamie Hall direct instructions on where to collect from, and while she was doing that, I was taking the notes. Okay. Double teaming it? Yes, sir. And, and I'm going I'm trying not to get the question. I apologize, but 226. Is that what's depicted? I can look at them. Yeah. Uh, this jacket is the jacket I examined. My lab number, the item number 173, my initials, and the date in which we examined it is on there. And is this the same picture of what we just showed, 430, I think? It's the same image that you just, or this is the jacket that was in the image you just showed. Okay, and I'm going to get this away. I don't want to bother any of the jurors, so I'll get this away here. 
So you and Ms. Hall lay this out to examine it, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. And how did you determine specifically where you were going to check to see if there were any particles? So typically when we're looking for gunshot primer residue, we're looking for somebody who was in the vicinity to the discharge of a firearm. Uh, for this particular case, uh, we were provided uh, information that something might have been transferred in this, something might have been transferred, something might have been transferred in this item to do on it, therefore to do on it, therefore we treat checked for transfer, they checked for transfer. Therefore, we had to collect particle entirety of the item, including of the item, including the interior. You can either do it. How did you do it? How did you do it? Particle lift or particle lift. So, in total, we collected 25 particle lifts from the jacket. Uh, when I say we covered everything, we covered everything. We collected from the exterior of the hood, the right sleeve, the left sleeve, the right chest, the left chest. There's a middle pocket um, on that, on the jacket. So we collected the whole middle section, including the pocket. The pocket also has like a hand warmer section. It's got a little bit of fleece inside. We collected from inside of that. And then we split the bottom half in two, collected one particle lift from uh, the right side and one from the left. We then flipped the jacket over and took one particle lift from the right sleeve into the right back on the top of the jacket, the left sleeve into the back on the top of the jacket. The, um, let me check this real quick. The back sample, um, the lower half was again split in half and the right side was collected as well as the left side. Be a little, you said 25. Were there a total of 52 particle lifts? Uh, there were a total of 25 particle lifts. How many on the outside? How many particle, particle lift? lifts? Yes, specifically, please.
actually turned it inside out. Correct. And tell, tell, what, tell what you and Miss Hall did. So once we turned it inside out, we collected particle lifts from the, the front and the back again. So the inside of the hood, the right sleeve to, you can see seam tape on this, it's that, um, it's that clear stuff that's kind of falling apart off of the um, jacket. Um, so we used that as kind of a guide for us. So we used the front right sleeve to the center section of the coat, the left front sleeve to the center section of the coat, the middle area, um, directly behind the pocket, um, the right and the left side on the bottom half the jacket. We turned it over again and did the right sleeve to the center point on the top of the jacket, the left sleeve to the center point on the um, top of the jacket, split the bottom in half again, did the right bottom half the jacket and left bottom half the jacket. And, and what, after your examination, what were your results? Particles characteristic of gunshot primer residue were also found on the interior of this jacket. Is there a certain number or, or could you have kept checking and checking? Was there a lot of gunshot primer residue inside the inside of the jacket? I would say there were a significant, no, significant number of particles uh, of particles characteristic of gunshot primer residue on the inside of this jacket, yes. How many did you determine? I'd, I confirmed 38 particles characteristic. And I'm saying determined, confirmed. You confirmed how many? 38. 38. Yes, sir. From the inside of the rain jacket, poncho. Yes, sir. Whatever this is, correct? Yes, sir. Could you, and you taught me a word too, is there something that uh, kind of led you? There could have been more, but you just basically stopped checking? So if we go back to when I talked about the automated analysis, it gives me a list of candidate features that may contain lead, barium, and antimony. There were uh, a significantly more, uh, significantly more particles uh, were listed as candidate features containing the elements lead, barium, and antimony. I had to make an analyst decision based on my experience to stop at the number that I did. Candidate features? Yes, sir. Which meant if you went on, you would expect to find more gunshot primer residue, correct? Right? It or could. Just... I would have had to still check the morphology. I would have had to make sure that they were molten around. I also have, would have had to check that they didn't contain exclusionary elements like um, high amounts of iron and magnesium. But there was a possibility that there would have been more on it. But you found 38. I confirmed 38, yes, sir. Okay. And 23 candidate features if you'd gone further, correct? Uh, more than 23. More than 23? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. Did there come a point, if you had finished that examination, how, how long would it have taken you if you had checked everything? If I had checked every single particle, it probably would have taken me a week. So is there a percentage that you determine, hey, I'm going to stop at this point and say, here are my results? There's some other candidate features. Is there a guideline out there? Uh, we don't have a specific guideline. It really is based on our experience. Um, and for this particular case, I stopped anywhere between 10 and 20 percent. Some areas I was able to do a full percent because, or a full 100 percent because there weren't that many to go look at. But other areas, I did have to make a determination. Of when to stop? Of when to stop, yes, sir. Okay. Can you look at the ladies and gentlemen of this jury and tell them in your opinion, your expert opinion, how that number of particles of gunshot residue primer, uh, what is that consistent with? Uh, if somebody was wearing this coat inside out, I would say that it's consistent with being in the vicinity to the discharge of a shooting. Uh, given that it's on the inside, uh, in order for it to be uh, consistent with transfer, an object or objects with a high amount of gunshot primer residue on it would have had to transfer to it. Um, so they would have had to have more gunshot primer residue particles on them to begin with in order to transfer the amount of gunshot primer residue I found on this coat. And, and as far as a recently fired firearm, would your, would your findings be consistent with that item containing a recently fired firearm? Uh, it is possible, yes. With that number of articles? Uh, with that number, it is possible. Is there any other possibility? 
You if, stated one. Are there any more? Uh, if the jacket was inside out and simply in the vicinity to the discharge of a firearm, it could have also had that number of particles on it. In your opinion, and just life in the job you love, that's a large number of particles, isn't it? It was a significant amount of particles, yes, sir. On the inside of the jacket? Yes, sir. And I'm not doing this for a bit, but just to show, I'm, I'm almost 60. I am 60, a little over six feet on the record flight. But anyway. This doesn't look like a full-length garment to you. I would, I would say that it would fit most people down to their knees or so. Make courts and dogs. Conclusion again, as far as the hood, you said there was one particle outside the hood? Uh, yes, sir. I was able to confirm one particle on the exterior of the hood. And how many particles on the inside of the hood did you determine there were? Three particles were confirmed on the inside. Inside of the hood? Yes, sir. And finally, uh, since this is an inanimate object, how long would you expect that gunshot primer residue to stay on there? Until it's actively removed. Say that again, towards what? Until it's actively removed. That means washed, cleaned, whatever. Uh, yeah, brushing it, like aggressively brushing it off, washing it in a washing machine, cleaned, hosed off, something like that. Recently fired firearm was wrapped up, wrapped up inside that jacket. Would that be consistent with your findings? There is a possibility of that, yes, sir. Okay. Thank you very much. That's all we have. Thank you. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to adjourn for the day and resume at 9.30 tomorrow morning. Please do not discuss, discuss the case. Have a good evening. Uh, you are, will be cross-examined tomorrow. You're not allowed to discuss your testimony with anyone between now and then. Okay. All right. We'll, we'll be in recess till tomorrow morning.